Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast. Each week, your host, Casey Haston, Director of Recruiting at VIP, will bring you valuable insights from thought leaders, introduce you to incredible companies, and bring you tips for landing your dream job from our team of executive recruiters at VIP. And now, Casey Haston. Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast, a podcast devoted to adding value to your career or candidate search, brought to you by VIP. I'm your host, Casey Haston. I'm an executive recruiter, director of recruiting with VIP, and your all around hiring guru. And you know, I get to meet some amazing people throughout my journeys, and I love to introduce those people to you. And I am just so excited about the guest we have today because this can change your life. So let me get right on to introducing him. So today on the show, I'd like to welcome Daniel Gutierrez, mindful leadership expert and owner of the Catalina Retreat Center in Pisac, Peru. And I probably said that wrong. Once a high powered executive and in demand consultant, Daniel realized that there was more to success than a seven figure earning potential. He is now an expert in helping others achieve a greater level of mindfulness. Daniel's style of coaching is direct yet caring and stems from a place of wisdom, love, peace, and tranquility. Thank you for joining us today, Daniel. Well, thank you for having me, Casey. I'm really excited about being here with you. I am so excited about our topic today, but before we dive into it, I have to share with the audience how we met because I think networking and connections (laughs) are so important. And it's always taking that step, that next step, that next introduction, you know, to get to the person that you need or want to meet or that the universe wants to deliver to you. So who introduced us? Uh, Brian Reinhold uh, introduced us and uh, it it, it was kind of a surprise, right? He said, hey, I have someone I want to meet you. And, you know, it is it is important. Network is always important. Yeah, we tricked you. And and, yeah, you did. I was like, huh? (laughs) No. You want me to do what? Be on a podcast? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and what's so interesting, I just want to take it a step back further because it's like a big spider web when you really start thinking about it, about networking and where it can lead you and who it can lead you to, right? And so if you take it a step back further, I met Brian in a networking organization that I belong to and I talk about a lot because I get a lot of my guests from this indirectly um, called the Networking Hub, which was founded by Frank Egan. It seems like all networking roads lead back to Frank, just so you know. <laughs> so I want to dig into this because this is the topic that is so important to me. I discovered mindfulness and meditation about three years ago. And I can tell you, I, I have what I refer to as a monkey brain. And I feel like, because it's like, choo, 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 just swinging from branch to branch. And I feel like this has really helped me to calm that chaos. And, you know, one of our VIP questions we ask every guest is, what is one thing you do each morning to set your day up for success? And this is our 112th show today, by the way. And after 111 shows, we really started to notice a trend in how people start their day. And, you know, it often goes back to mindfulness or meditation. I mean, I would venture to say probably 70 to 80 percent of the time that's the answer we get. So what do you think or why do you think mindfulness and meditation are such powerful tools? Well, they're powerful tools because they set a precedence on what your day is going to be like. If we start our day by calming our breathing, calming ourselves, calming uh, especially maybe if you had a, a, a bad night, you didn't sleep well, you had bad dreams, uh, you had health issues, getting centered in the morning, especially high-powered individuals. High-powered individuals, by the way, high-level networking uh, individuals all have monkey mind, like mine. We all do. So this is why this is important, to be able to control uh, that, that, that energy that we have so early in the morning. Now, you said, what do I do first thing in the morning? It always leads to uh, mindfulness or meditation. But there's one thing I do before mindfulness and meditation every single day and is one of the things that very successful people always all do. You know what that is? No, please tell me because I'm going to add it to my day. I make my bed. Oh, okay. Okay. I make my bed. Okay. So 
I've read the book, and I will tell you just a really quick story about that. And I'm so bad, but let me tell you why I don't make my bed. My little Pomeranian Chihuahua cross is so lazy, she doesn't get up till noon. And so she's ah. still in the bed. <laughs> so I love so, it. But my, my, this is crazy. My mom never taught me to make my bed. My mother-in-law is the one who taught me to make my bed. And she was ah, like, you do this first thing in the morning, you put the rest of your day in order, Casey. Yeah, well, I find that when I don't make my bed, it seems to set me off on a very scattered thought process because I'm thinking I should have made my bed mm -hmm. instead of what I should be focused on in the moment. So mindfulness and meditation is part of that process for me. What What is the first thing I do? I get up, I make my bed so that I at least feel that if I decide I need to come in and take a 10 minute break, that the bed's ready for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I and you know, there's a whole book. This uh, commander, I, do you know who I'm talking about? Make your bed, the Navy. Yeah, well, I haven't read the book. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. really good. But that was one of the tenets. Is he's like, this is why we made our bed so perfect every single day. You know, it, it's right. worth listening to. He did a speech um, at a college or a university, and it was amazing. Totally worth listening to. Um, so, but what? Tell us a little bit. I, I talked a little bit about your journey. But I want to hear from you. Tell us a little bit about your journey and how did that set you up to be a mindfulness coach? You know, I think most coaches end up being a coach uh, out of out of their own experiences. And I think that was the same thing for me. So, you know, at one time I was um, out speaking. My speaking career was doing well. I was president of an organization in New York City. I was... Uh, um, also working with the Obama administration uh, as a consultant. And my life was crazy getting up and I lived in Los Angeles. I worked in, in New York and, you know, going back and forth. I, I finally realized that I was going to have a heart attack and die if I didn't mm -hmm. find some way to get myself calm because my lifestyle wasn't going to change, but I could change how I saw my lifestyle. And so I began to realize that even in, you know, these big buildings in New York City and in, in New York, Chicago, that architects always put fountains in front of these buildings. And I, I finally realized that these, these fountains had a dual purpose besides design. It also was for humans to relax. Yet we never use them for that. We just look at them and say, oh, that's a nice fountain. And I began to sit in front of these fountains and really begin to a breathe or eat lunch in front of them or realize that the water was soothing for me. And so just out of design, I began to realize, okay, I need to really start meditating. I need to really start slowing down when I can. And even in a meeting, a high stress meeting or a high uh, level presentation, staying calm and present is very present, uh, important, but you can't start deciding to be present and and mindful in a presentation. It has to start before, so you're not, you know, messing up your words in the middle of your presentation, you know, and that kind of got me started. And, you know, I finally realized that a lot of my colleagues who were high powered executives were in the same position. I remember once doing a presentation for uh, Mercedes Benz. And as I was coming out, they said, oh, I said, who's the guy in the car? Right in the number one slot, there was a, there was a person slumped over the uh, steering wheel. And I said, oh, that's the CEO of the company. <laughs> and I said, well, what a bad example. Oh. I mean, that's, I mean, I said, he needs to definitely find a way to find mindfulness and, and, and meditation so that he's not in that position in front of his own building and passed out because he fell asleep. So th this is kind of how I got started with mindfulness and really helping people. I mean, I really thought about the person in New York City, you know, on the seventh floor of some building and, and, and if you think about, if you tell people to get quiet, all they hear is, ar, 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 ar. it is loud, right. right? And even in that, even in that chaos, you can still find a way to calm your mind and not allow your mind or the noise to be distracting, right? Because the distraction is always going to be there. We can decide whether the distraction is going to run us or we're going to be able to relax in the midst of it. Absolutely all of that. And I think one of the things that, you know, was hardest for me and the pushback that I get from people are like, oh, my brain is just too busy. I can't shut it up. And 
it, it does take some work, but it's also becoming the observer of your thoughts and not participating with them that helps to calm that chaos. So when you're teaching people mindfulness, can you give us some basic ways that we could start a practice if we've never done this before? Yeah, I, I think the very basic first step in all meditation and or mindfulness is f uh, finding a way to stop. Mm -hmm. Now, here, here's an interesting thing. The title of my book is Finding Peace and Tranquility in Less Than 60 Seconds. I got so much flack for putting that on a book because my, you know, my colleagues were like, Daniel, why are you telling people they can find peace and tranquility in 60 seconds? And you know, that's not true. And I was like, well, how, how many years have you been practicing your meditation practice or your, or your mindfulness practice? Well, 20 years. I said, great. You should be able to do it in 10 seconds. <laughs> the truth is that, that most of us don't have more than 60 seconds. And, and so when we think about meditation and mindfulness, we see somebody, mm, you know, maybe in a yoga outfit in this beautiful meditation center, maybe like mine here in Peru. <laughs> and, and that's just not, that's just not r real. The, tr the truth is, is that we got to find those 60 seconds mm -hmm. in our life. So the very first thing I would say is, you know, uh, tr track your breathing, really breathe. Right now, I can promise you, people watching the show are holding their breath. Really breathe. Really stop. Just and let your shoulders drop. And then you realize you haven't been breathing at all. Well, what happens when the brain doesn't get oxygen? You're not a very effective person, <laughs> right? So breathing is the first thing I would talk about. Another one that I used to use and still use is aromas. What do I mean by aromas? Maybe you like vanilla, a vanilla candle. What you want to do is train your brain that when it smells that fragrance, it slows you down immediately. So it might be vanilla, it might be lavender, it might be essential oils, it might be whatever it is that, that, that works for you and calms you down. And sometimes we have to kind of, um, uh, we have to train our brain to do that. The most powerful sense we have is smell. Mm -hmm. And we need to learn to use it in order to calm us and put us in a position so that we can be more effective in our work or career. So I use what's called Palo Santo, sacred smoke from the, uh, that comes from Peru and Ecuador. And I would carry, because you know, it's, it's a, a, a piece of wood that you light and it's the actual smoke that has a beautiful uh, fragrance. Well, you can't be going around lighting fires just anywhere. <laughs> so I bought the essential oil and the essential oil I would use even in a meeting. I would just like put a drop in and just and calm myself down. Some of us need that. The other thing that I would uh, recommend is music. Some of us respond to music. Well, then find the music. And I'm not talking about ACDC or anything like that. You know, of course, I'm aging myself. People are like, who's ACDC? <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so, so, you know, use music to calm you down and use the same music so that your brain says, oh, time to calm down. And so those are the first steps. If you can't get to calm, you're not going to get very far with meditation and mindfulness. So I've recently discovered going along the theme of music, binaural beats. Have you mm -hmm. used those with your meditation? No. Oh, no. I love I it because, it, yeah, and it signals the different uh, brain wavelengths. I'm not sure I'm going to totally mess this up if I say it, but anyway, there's one that helps you get into more of a meditative state. And I think it's Theta? Is it Theta? I don't know. Theta. Yeah. Okay. Theta it is Theta. Beta, right. Yeah. And then Alpha, which I don't right. know that we get into. I don't know. I, I'm not a neuroscientist. I have been binging on this stuff lately, but I just, ah, I, I need it. to binge some more. So, you know, I, and I love that. And I've also heard of different types of breaths. Do you work with different types of breaths or do you just the inhale, exhale? Yeah. Well, there are different types. There's Prana. There's, I mean, there's like dip fast, they're slow. I, when I think about the person that doesn't know anything about meditation and mindfulness, all I want them to do is breathe. Because mm -hmm. if we get them into things that they don't understand, they're more likely to quit. It's kind of like going on a diet. You know, if you try to do all your diet at one time on the same day, you're not going to last very long because it's right. just not going to be fun. So with breathing, it's just really simple. Just stop and take 10 deep breaths from inside and just watch how your body relaxes. Once you get into a practice of meditation, you know, my, my hope for people is, and the reason why I say 60 seconds is because if you see the results in 60 seconds, 
of what it can do for you. You might do it 120, 180, 240. And the next thing you know, you're meditating 15 minutes and that can change your life and change your health. When I first started meditating, you know, it was like five minutes. It was just killing me to get through it. And, you know, then when I started getting a little bit more used to it, and I use a guided meditation. I have one that I use off YouTube called Great Meditation that I absolutely love. They put on, out new guided meditations almost every single day. And, but then as I started increasing my time and they would start bringing me out of it, I was like, I'm not done. I, I'm, I'm still meditating, you know, and it, right. but it's so good and I just love it. I'm, I, in fact, even if I only can meditate for five minutes, I, meditation is, it, it's not a deal breaker. You know, it, it's a, it has to be done every morning or I don't feel complete. Right. And I think you said something that's very important. You do what works for you, period. If I, if whatever I'm saying doesn't work, that's fine. Just find something that does. Absolutely. You know, and I work with people every day. So I'm a recruiter. I think most people that listen to this podcast know that, you know that. And so I work with a lot of people that, um, you know, are looking for a new job and that can be really stressful. And that leads to a lot of nerves and a lot of, you know, anxiety, especially when preparing for an interview. What are some tips or some advice that you could share with these people that are about to walk into an interview to help them calm down and release that anxiety? There's a couple of things. Uh, stress and anxiety are self-inflicted. Just remember that. Mm. That that if it and self-inflicted things are a choice. It's a choice. And I know that there's anxiety and depression that needs to be medically dealt with. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the salesperson or the person going in for an interview. Uh, stress and anxiety are self-inflicted. These are things we create in our own mind. They're not even real. First of all, so I'm just going to say that because I know most people go, oh, Daniel, come on. <laughs> second, second, I want to say that in doing an interview, and I got trained to do interviews for TV and radio. And, and so one of the things that I learned that I remembered most was the person on the other side of the interview has no idea what you're about to say. So there's nothing that you could possibly say that's going to be wrong unless you admit it. Oh. Once you admit it in an interview, you're done. Because now the interviewee That's is awesome. looking at you and waiting to see if you're going to make another mistake. You just blew your interview. They don't know what you're going to say or what you're going to say or just keep going and, to, and pause so that they can respond and give you a minute to, to pull it together. The third thing, and this is something I learned selling water treatment systems door to door in actually Dallas, Texas. <laughs> I remember having to go and knocking on doors and selling these $4,000 and people slamming the doors. But before we went to the door, they taught me to do something. And that was that all the things that we're talking about, stress, anxiety, oh my gosh, is this an interview? What am I going to do? All this stuff was creating chaos in my mind. And so one of the things I learned to do was to reach up. I mean, even sometimes right in front of the, of the sales pitch or right in front of the interview was I reached up and grabbed my ear and I flushed that toilet. Whoosh. And I could hear it going on and it would be gone and I would continue forward. So it was just a little act of reaching up and teaching my brain to release what was there. So I would like, whoosh. and that, and these little things made a difference in, clo in closing opportunities, interviews, sales deals. It makes a big difference. Those are such awesome tips. And those are things we've never had before. So I love that <laughs> so much, especially the part about they don't know what you're going to say. So they don't, don't admit that you're wrong. No, right. I love that. That's the worst thing you can do. Uh, that's so, and, and it does. It does. It kind of triggers that neural pathway to think, OK, what are they going to do wrong next if they've already admitted yes. this? Beautiful. Right. I love that. So I get the job. How can employers and managers foster and encourage more mindfulness at work? You know, this is a tough one because we live in a society where there are many rules and laws against what we can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. And what I remember once doing a uh, presentation or training for a big corporation, a bunch of managers, and they asked me the same question. And I said, well, if, you, if you're in a business that, that doesn't allow you to dictate what people can and can't do, the best thing you can do is be the example. Mm -hmm. Let them see you meditating. Let them see you at your desk breathing. They'll ask. They're going to ask because when they see you come. Now, if you're going around, you know, like the Tasmanian devil through the office, they're, they're not going to believe that you're meditating <laughs> or mindful. 
<laughs> I can tell you that right now. The second thing is, is in businesses, I think it's important to offer a place where people can go mm-hmm. and, and spend a few minutes being quiet. Um, other than that, I think, I think our hands are tied sometimes in businesses. Uh, but I think if you're the example and you show what it's like to be mindful and present and, 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 and your meditation is working, then you're going to be more able to not react versus being in a position to just listen and, and be, um, present in the moment. Um, those are the things that, that I know I practiced in big business when I was in big business. Mm-hmm. Um, again, because we weren't allowed to say, Hey, you know, you can do this, you can do that, but providing opportunities is a great thing. One of the things that I also did is I would say, Hey, I'm going to do a, a five minute meditation. You're welcome to join me. If you'd like make mm-hmm. it an option, make it an option, but do it. Uh, I remember once going through a real hard time in my life and I, and I was doing this um, a chanting thing that I learned from in, from India. And I decided that I was going to let people on social media and, and my database know that I was going to do this every morning at nine in the morning, Pacific Standard Time. And here's the number. Join me if you'd like. Before you knew it, I had three, four hundred people and wow. they would jump on and, and just chant with me. And I wouldn't I didn't say anything. I didn't pitch anything. I just said, hey, I'm doing what I need to do if you're welcome to join me and this is a good way to get other people to do mindfulness and meditation that is that is beautiful and going back to a couple of things your quiet spot i've been advocating for a nap pod that i think would be perfect for meditation in our office yes so far yes i'm not getting any takers but another thing no no nap pod (laughs) no nap pod not yet so but the other thing that i do and a couple of things but i've really noticed since i've been meditating you know I was that Tasmanian devil. I would come into the office in the morning and I would just stir everything up, right? And now I'm the complete opposite. It's like a calming effect when I come into the office. But here's something else I do that's really cool. I found a program and I can't remember the name of it. I'll have to find it, we'll put it in the show notes, that will you type in your your affirmations, right? What you believe in, what you wanna see. And then it flashes them on your screen subliminally. So you can oh, see them nice. for just a couple of seconds, but all day long, my affirmations are flashing at me and hitting my subconscious, right? But I have people come over to my desk and they're like, what, is, what just flashed across your screen? And they're like, no, I love it. That, where did you get it. that? Yeah. So I, I think that that's true that, you know, and then if they don't know what affirmations are, they're like, well, what is that? What are you doing? Mm-hmm. You know? And, and then that leads to a whole nother conversation. So I agree with you. I think those are some really excellent tips for companies that, you know, are wanting to help their people that are working there. Um, Just remember that successful people do what unsuccessful people won't do. Mm-hmm. That is so And like you having true. that thing flashing because it's so important what you put into your subconscious mind. That is the driver of your life. That, yep. is, the, that is the genie in the bottle. And if the, if what you're putting in there is trash, then trash is what you're going to get. Yep. And so I think that's great. I can't wait to see the notes so I can see what the program is. <laughs> I'll have to go find it. I just, I've had it on yeah. my computer for so long. I forgot what the name of it was. And I just randomly found it in a book that I read one day. So I thought that was just really cool, but let's talk about this from a different perspective now. So let's, how does mindfulness help increase leadership qualities? I think the biggest thing, and I was like you, I was a Tasmanian devil too. My, I can my see that. employees <laughs> hated it. When I it, it, actually at one point, and I didn't know this for a long time until I ran out of coffee, they changed my coffee from 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 caffeinated to decaf, and I never knew it until I ran out, and then I realized, wait a minute, who changed my decaf? Well, you've been drinking it for six months. We just can't take you, you know, because <laughs> I would go in and change things and come back and make them change it back, right? So. The, so I'm saying that because mindfulness for a, a manager, uh, an executive is important because our, if you walk into your place of business and people are waiting to see what your mood's in, what mood you're in, you're not doing a very good job of managing because people are reacting to your, your state of mind, your state of a place that you are. When we're mindful, think about this, every decision you make as a leader should come first with at least a three, four or five minute meditation. 
so that you're coming from a sound mind, not a reaction. Yep. It's the same thing with your, your significant others. If you're going to have an argument about something that's probably petty anyway, you might want to take a deep breath and wait until you've calmed down before you spit it all out and then cause a bigger problem. And that's why mindfulness is important in that sense, because taking a deep breath and stepping back with an employee or, or subordinate is even more important in a business because most managers are reactionary. They're, they don't think about their, their actions until it's too late. And, and they don't really even sometimes care because mm -hmm. that's just the way they manage. That's, that's not going to get you results. It may get you results because people fear you, but it won't be a fun place to work. Yeah. And I don't want to be in those places where it's not fun to work. Those days are way over. You know, the day that I quit <laughs> liking my job is the day that I quit the job. Right. So there fortunately, I don't I have agree. that problem. I love my job. Um, so tell me a little bit about your book, Radical Mindfulness. What can people learn from this book? Well, you know, the biggest thing is that I wrote the book for a couple of reasons. One, my mother had passed away and it was a very devastating time for me. Um, and, and I wanted to share my relationship with her. I wanted to talk about who I was and what caused this big change in me from a high level executive in New York City to actually the next book I'm writing, the, the working title is From the Boardroom to Medicine Man. Like, <laughs> how did I get from, from that $2,000 suit to what I'm wearing right now, a jacket, right? <laughs> you know? And, and so the, this book, uh, Radical Mindfulness, uh, has practices that I believe are important to the basic understanding of mindfulness, but more importantly, the steps to being radically mindful. Like, and I'm going to give you just one, one question that uh, I know a lot of my clients love. And it's one of the six steps or, or six questions. And one of them is, am I okay right now? Ooh. Because if, 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 I'm, if I'm okay right now, then why am I, why am I continuously in the past or the, or the future? Mm. Am I okay right now? Is what I'm thinking real or am I making it up because I'm, I'm living it in the past or the future? The, most, the greatest power we have is in the right here and the right now. If you haven't made that call to that person you need to call, then it's because you fear something that has not really happened yet. And I'll give you a quick example. I was coaching a, a real estate um, gal and she was making good money, 50000 a month, you know, uh, in her brokerage. She was doing well. And I remember once walking in her office and going, well, she was in a bad mood and, and she had these files on her desk. And I said, well, what are these files? She goes, well, these are people that, that just don't want to talk to me. I said, well, can I look at them? She goes, sure. There was this one file that was, um, I said, well, what's wrong with this file? So what's the commission on this, on this file? She says 15,000. I said, and why haven't you called this person? It looks like they're approved. Oh, because it took me too long and they're probably mad at me. I said, they're probably, it's $15,000 commission is sitting on your desk and you think they might be mad at you. Don't you think you should call and find out? She goes, yeah, I will. No, now. Now? Yes, now. So she calls this guy, yelled at her for 15 minutes. <laughs> like, I can't believe. And then she closed the deal. <laughs> and I said, see, this, this, is, this is why mindfulness is important. Because if we get caught up in the two places we have absolutely no power in, the past or the future, we totally forget that in the moment, and especially as, as salespeople, managers, people, even people doing interviews, stay focused in the right here, right now, and tomorrow will take care of itself. Yep. But if you, if you fear today that you can't pay your lease or your employees at the end of the month because you don't have enough money, the only thing I can tell you is that if you just sit there long enough, it will become true because you didn't act in the moment. Pick the phone up and make the phone call. That's why it's important to stay present. That is so much good stuff right there. And I just like, <laughs> I'm, I cannot wait to go back and listen to all this. I'm going to have to beg that we edit this very quickly so that I can have this to use. Um, I love what jo uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza calls the present moment. He calls it the generous present moment in the predictable right. past. And you're right, there's nothing you can do about the past. All we have is this moment right here. And being present, being in the now is the greatest gift that we can give ourselves because it does yes. us no good to worry about what's gonna happen in the future. I'm not saying don't take you know, action, but don't worry about it, right? Right. 
So no, you have to take action because you don't take action. You will have something to worry about. Right. Right. It, it, but it's about getting And again, that question is, am I okay right now? Where are my thoughts? Are they in the yeah. past or the present? Are, are the thoughts I'm having real? Have they ever been real? No. <laughs> That's going to take no. it to a whole nother level. <laughs> yeah, that, not, not, now we're really talking, right? <laughs> yeah, That's we what are. my book talks about, right? It's talking about how do I find a way to make myself, my relationship, my business, my finances successful? Ugh. Stay present. When's the next book coming out? I can't wait. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. You know, I thought coming out here when I moved out here almost two years ago um, that I was going to write this book called Radical Detachment because I literally came out here with two suitcases. Everything I had, baby pictures, old relationships, accolades, my son's baby pictures, everything I shred. I came with nothing. Wow. And, that's what I, and, and, I, and I got here and I was thinking, what have I done? What are you crazy? You know, and, and that's, an, that's another, an, a day for another story, another, another show. But the truth is, is that life really unfolded well. And I have to tell you the funny thing that happened to me. And for those of you that are authors out there, maybe you've experienced this. You know, I've written five books and I'm sitting here in the middle of this, this quarantine, the pandemic. Here in Peru, we were under martial law. I could not leave my house. Wow. And my employees couldn't come here. So 40 days, it was just me and the dogs. You know, and I remember getting angry. I was so, how did I move out of the U.S. to get stuck here? There's no income. There's nothing. And then I remember something that, that said, uh, hey, stupid, why don't you read your own book? And I said, <laughs> well, that's a good idea. And I started to read. And, and the tools that I'm talking about, really, because I begin to ask myself those questions. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Am I okay right now? Yes. Or what are the thoughts you have of like, you know, this place blowing up or whatever, you dying or whatever. Is it, is it real? No. Then stay present, enjoy your day, go out and play with the dogs because there's nothing else you can do. Right. And when we can get into that space, I think the universe opens up and just gives us everything mm -hmm. that we desire that because there's no resistance anymore. Yes. And when there's no resistance. Life happens. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. And I want to ask you one more question before we move to yep. our final questions, because the it's, time is just flying by. I could talk to you all day. <laughs> um, but I, I want to know um, a little bit more about your retreat and why is it important to kind of change your environment to get to that mindfulness state? I think it's important to change environment because we're creatures of habit. And if we're stuck in the same old rut that we're always stuck in every single day, and we think that by going to playing golf with our cell phones, cell phones, three, four, that we're getting away, we're really not. But when you leave your country and you get put in a position, like here at my center, we have Wi-Fi, but not necessarily in your room. We don't mm. have TVs, we don't have telephones. You know, we have nature, we have mountains. And, and people come here and finally get to realize, wow, that life is different. I had, I had, I've had people come out executive and say, I didn't realize I was such an ass, <laughs> you know, and I really need to change that. And I said, wow, I'm glad to, I'm sure your people will appreciate that. But until you change your environment, you're still stuck in the same old, you're in the same rut mm -hmm. and, and you got to pull out of that rut and see something different. Or maybe even here, I think some of the things that help people here is that we're in a developing country. You see people here with shoes and mud on their feet. They don't have a lot. And sometimes we need to realize that the problems that we call problems in our world are not problems at all and get some perspective about who, not only that, but who we are and getting a chance to connect to nature and ourselves and find a way to find that middle ground that you've been looking for. And I think that a retreat center, whether it be mine or someone else's, offers that because of the, usually the environment is calm. You know, there's nothing pressing. Uh, of course, people can get on their email if they need to. That's fine. But most importantly, they're given tools to relax and and really take a look at their lives. I mean, one of the things that, that I've said many times about the, uh, I've told Brian many times, as a matter of fact, our friend, if our calendars during this pandemic period when we really were locked up, we weren't able to get out, if our calendars were were just as busy as before the pandemic we learned nothing we were given an opportunity to look in the mirror and say who am i what am i am i in the right job career in the right place and if we stuffed it full of zoom calls because that's all we know 
then we really didn't learn anything except a different format of a different addiction is what I say, because I think our world's addicted to everything, right? <laughs> and, and so retreats offer you that opportunity not to be there. That is so beautiful. And I am looking so forward. We are already planning our trip in 2023. Yay. I know it's a long ways off, but you know, you got to plan for these. Plus fast. it's going to be a big yeah. deal for me that year. So right. I am super excited to come meet you in person. Appreciate your time Likewise. so much today, but nobody gets out of here without answering our VIP questions. Yeah. And you've already answered one, so you've only got two more to answer. So if you were chosen to be one of the first colonists on Mars, what three things or people would you bring with you? You know, it's interesting because when I first read that, I thought, well, I mean, I want to be funny, but I live in the Andes of Peru. And I know when I leave here and I go high up into the mountains to visit with the indigenous people, I always think I always take oxygen. I don't know if there's oxygen on Mars. <laughs> I mean, and maybe I'm being too practical, but I'm thinking if I'm going to be up there, I don't want to die. Okay. So I said oxygen. Of course, the second thing I thought, well, I'm, I'm in, it's winter here. So why I'm wearing a jacket and I hate being cold. So I definitely need to have fire so that I can sustain myself. And the last thing would be, you know, uh, what's the other thing I carry with me all the time, uh, everywhere I go, water. Uh, and there's water and those are the three things and i know they're not sound like a lot of fun but in my head went to practical because i i take people up in the mountain and i'm always going got your oxygen or i got oxygen in my backpack and i got water and we got a way to start fire in case it gets cold uh and i if i mean i don't know anything about mars <laughs> unless you're talking about the mars candy bar <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so interesting. We spent the last week in Colorado up in the mountains and we were hiking like day two. Now I'm a sea level girl and day two, we decided to hike this mountain up to 12,000 feet. I thought I was going to wow. die. Yeah. Day two. Of course you did. And so, but then oxygen. I was, exactly. I was in one of the stores and I found they had these little canisters of oxygen that you can yes, just carry with you. Them. I was like, yes. oh my God, my life is going to be changed forever now that I can do this. Yeah. So anyway, so I digress. So we've already answered the question. I have my green can. <laughs> yep, exactly. We've already answered the question about what's one thing you do to set your day up for success. And you're like, make your right. bed. That's what we got to do. So my final question is if your life's work was being summarized in a news article, what would the headline be? Uh, and I wrote that down and, and I'm going to give you the answer I wrote down because I, I, I think about that and, and my life is just so, so beautiful today. It's so hard to summarize that. And, and, um, but I'm going to give you the, what I wrote down and it's, it's really the working title of my next book. And that is from the boardroom to medicine, man, yeah. like, you know, this, you know, how, how do we find true joy in our life? You know, one of the things I've very often asked about. Uh, is how do you know you made the right decision leaving the U.S. to live in a country that's so different from ours? And it's very simple. Every morning when I get up and I, I, I make myself coffee, and by the way, here it's not like probably where you are. There's You don't push a button. and I have to go downstairs. It's so cold because there's no heater, no, there's a, no AC, there's no heating system, and, and I have to heat water. I mean, I have to do all this because there's no hot water downstairs there is in the center but not downstairs so then i have to do all this stuff to make coffee and i'm so appreciative that i get to do that and i have my cup of coffee and i take my dogs out and i walk my property and when i walk my property and make sure my animals are okay and the buildings are okay something happens that i've never experienced in my entire life my soul smiles from the inside out mm. my soul says all is well with my soul i am happy here thank you and that's something i wish for everybody Ugh, that is beautiful. If I had a mic, I'd drop it right now. Beautiful. <laughs> how, how do people find you and learn more about what you offer, your books, everything, all the good stuff? Okay, so they, I have two websites. My first okay. one is simple, Dan, danielgutierrez.com. It's my name, danielgutierrez.com. And the Catalina website is catalinaretreatcenterperu.com. And in both those places, you can find me, you can make an appointment with me, you can talk to me. I talk to everybody. I'm like you. I love to talk to people. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, I uh, I think they're always surprised when I go, where are you? I said, well, I know I have a little accent, it's Dallas, it's a Texas accent, but I'm in the Andes of Peru. They're like, what? You know, <laughs> so I love to talk to people. If people want to, you know, talk to me about anything, I'm, I'm here for them. 
That is so awesome. All right. Well, we have got to wrap up this show. We are at our time limit, but I have one last thing to say to you, Daniel. Mm. You are a VIP. Thank you. Thank you for having me also. I really appreciate it. And that's a wrap for today. Join us next week here on the We Are VIP podcast. We'd love to know how we can help you be a VIP. To find out more, log on to wearevip.com.